Hi, everybody, and welcome to my talk. This time I'll be talking about uh, performance tuning Grails applications. And first, the uh, agenda. So first, we're going to look a little bit behind the mo motivation of all this work and then look about the second second point is about strategy and then the third part is just small little tips and little tricks and missteps and I'll also show a short demo of profiling with your kit So what is performance about? There certainly is uh, many aspects and I've picked a few here. Latency of operations that's something we want to ensure so that we get users that are happy in using in our application. Then we're interested in the throughput of the operations, like how, how many operations we can get with a single hardware or solution we, we have for running the operations. The third part is that we're also interested in knowing about the quality of operations when there is load on the system. In quality, we could think of uh, correctness of the operations, consistency of the data, resilience, the error resilience of the system, security aspects under load, and usability. And there's also many other like system availability and so on. <coughs> so thinking of why we might start thinking of uh, doing a performance optimization for any system. We might be looking for optimizing the costs for running the system we have. So that's about operational efficiency. We might be interested in tuning our system to meet its performance requirements with optimal cost. Performance is also a feature of our system. We have to make sure that we keep up the quality of the operations under high load. And they, they were on the previous side, slide, these correctness, consistency, resilience, security, usability, availability. So there's, there's some motivation for, for doing almost any, any kind of performance optimization. This is not specifically related to, to Grails applications. But I think it's important to have the meaning in, in doing it. And one, one uh, motivation we de developers tend to have is that we just feel better when our system is fast. That's, that's of course, that's some, some extra coolness 
and, and being in a pro programmer job. But the important thing is to concentrate on, on kind of the business needs of, of the performance tuning. We don't do things just to, to get them faster without any meaning. Then about the how side, like how to do performance tuning. Lift your hands up if you were in the first talk. So about half, half were in the first talk. And in the, at the first talk, I, I talked about Amdahl's law. And I'll also talk about that related to this performance tuning and optimization because it uh, gives some understanding of the problem we're attacking here. And what Amdahl's law, what we can kind of learn of that law is that if we're trying to speed up a certain logical computation one single unit of computation. Uh, adding, adding more processors or nodes or cores to the, to the system, it won't have any effect if we're not able to parallelize uh, the most, most of the operations in, in our system. Like these di different lines here, this is a line for 50% parallel portion, and this one is for, for 95%. So uh, when, we, when we add 16 cores to, to the system, the, we'll be able to do a little less than uh, 10 times speed up in that case. But if, if we're not able to do par in parallel, it, it won't have hardly any effect compared. So there will be only twice as fast at 16, 16 nodes or cores. So, so that's, that's something to remember when, when doing, doing things along, around this. And related to the talk I, I had in the morning, this doesn't mean that you can't use current, the current, or you can, can't uh, get a current way of doing Rails application to scale. It doesn't mean that you have to switch to asynchronous programming and everything. Since uh, we could think of the different request threads that they're, they're on their own if they're not sharing any anything and blocking each other, they're kind of, uh, you're able to do that in parallel. Of course, there are other aspects to that, like uh, if, if there's uh, 10,000 concurrent users on your, or 10,000 10, concurrent requests running on your system, then you have to be able to handle that, that load. So, so that's not the whole, whole story. So the strategy, I'd like to talk about that first. And um, what, you, what, what is really important is not to just concentrate on buying some certain set of tools and, and then we'll have this sorted out or hiring a performance consultant to come in for a week and after that he'll solve all our problems. What is much more important is to, to be able to do continuous improvement here. And I've, I've kind of copied some, some uh, similar lean startup uh, learning cycle here, or you could find that in, in many agile methods that you 
that you build something, then you measure something, and you, then you learn, learn based on that, and you iterate. So, so here, here, using that idea, we're first uh, setting up our own feedback cycle for tuning our, our system with the, with the resources like the people we have to work there that we, we, we start from that basis and aim for continuous improvement. And I'll show, show that as a picture to nice, nice picture where we have the measure and profile, then think and learn and do tuning and fixes. And then you keep on going round and round. And one, one advice here is to, to start with small steps, that you start with the tools you have available, and then you could add more tools and methods in the next iteration. And the, the tools you could start using, you could, you could even start with, um, with some tools that with, within their evaluation period, usually many tools have like commercial good tools, they have uh, 30 days evaluation period, but during that you could kind of evaluate that is it valuable for, for your optimization and tuning cycle, that will you benefit from those tools. And then next, next step is to, to after, after doing some measurements, is to think and learn and analyze and, and plan the next cha change. And also like finding and evaluating the next, next set of tools and methods you, you have, to, have to get. <laughs> And in each iteration, optimally, you do only a single change or a controlled amount of change. So, so that this will help you to learn about your system's performance and operational aspects. Because if you do many, many changes at, a, at the at the, in a single iteration, you don't know which change helped and w which didn't. So it's better to do s in, in quick iterations. For example, your iteration might be like five minutes. It takes you to do the cycle, and then, then, you, then you do the next step. It doesn't mean that you have to do a one-week iteration. It's, it's more like um, just doing one, one step at a time. And what is really important is to set up a, a, diff your, a different feedback cycle for production environments. Because the production is the environment which is bringing you the money, and it's, uh, usually it's irrelevant if the system performs well on your laptop because it might be different in, in production for many different reasons. And if you're not directly involved in operations, use some innovative means to, to set up a feedback cycle. It might be something, something different, and, but you have to find out a way to, to get feedback from, from production. And if you're a uh, company that doesn't, does, it's selling a software product that it doesn't do operations at itself, there are other ways to, do, to get some kind of uh, feedback and measurements. But certainly there are different um, methods and ways to do this in, in development environments and, and production environments. And here I'm talking more about some of the things I already mentioned, like from the Amdahl's law. 
you, you won't be able to speed up a single computation if you cannot parallelize it. In, in traditional Rails code, this means that each request thread shouldn't block other threads. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to switch to asynchronous handling of, of requests. And it doesn't have that as text here, but um, besides the error handling is, is scaling in situations where you have a huge amount of clients, then, then it's almost the only option that you also, the request handling phase is asynchronous. But asynchronous doesn't mean fast, so so it's it's more about the scaling the uh, scaling the so solution and getting error resilience and and optimal efficiency of hardware in in when when also this phase is is asynchronous. Then about the measurements, uh, the idea is to find the most limiting bottleneck one by one and el eliminate it. And what is uh, hard work here is that you have to usually re-measure after each change because the behavior of the concurrent execution may be different after a small change in reducing blocking and and then the, usually the the problem in the next measurement it's not the one that was the second one on the previous measurement Also mentioning here uh, some some things about uh, keeping 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 up the cl clarity and consistency of your solution. So don't do things just for for because this is faster or a faster way of doing this. Uh, you should uh, value clarity over over uh, some performance tricks in, in the code. So don't introduce accidental complexity there. And one, one thing about measurements is to, to do different type of testing, like uh, it, you get a lot of insight if you, you do uh, kind of a soak test for your application that you find the saturation point. And you could think, or you could test like how how does latency change when you add load and and do graphs about that and what happens to your system when you, when you add load to the point where where it stops uh, scaling and when it gets overloaded like that do all the operations stop and you lose availability for all clients or does it continue serving the, some 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 of the clients. Here's uh, going now now into actual JVM code profi profiling. I'll introduce two concepts, which are quite uh, important to understand in the way how code profilers work. So there's uh, typically two, two main ways to profile method execution. Other one is uh, sampling and the other one is instrumentation. And in, by instrumentation, the profiler uses uh, different means to, to add measurements to exact measurements to, to each, to the methods, to the selected methods. But in st statistical ways, 
the measurements are done by sampling every certain milliseconds part. And you might think that this is a bad way of doing things and it's unreliable. Unre and they certainly are some, the measures, something that you can't rely on. But since you're doing performance optimization, you usually get a better understanding of the problem if you look to learn to look past the numbers returned from the measurements. The, the reason for this is that uh, it's, it's very hard to, to, to get an understanding what the JVM and, and the, the hotspot and JIT compiler are doing, doing behind the schemes. And I have found out that I've got better, better results by, by just uh, trying to understand the problem with and, and using this sampling profiling instead of instrumentation. But the tools uh, lead easily to a different direction that you're looking for some exact values and sorting and, and interpreting the results in, in a way that you're expecting that it, you're getting uh, exact measurements. And, and the problem here is that with instrumentation you get exact measurements but then it might, the execution happens totally different way because it might be, it has side effects. And, and that's, that's part of the problem, but you, you know, it's kind of hard to explain what this <laughs> actually is, but just that you know when you, you go into profiling that uh, don't look too much at the numbers or the numeric values, but, but use it to, to find relative differences and so on. Then for generating load, especially I'm concentrating here on, on the development side, what I've, I've used. And This, this is uh, Apache Bench, which is uh, almost installed on all Linuxes by, by default if you have Apache installed there. And the, and the downsides of this, this tool is that when machines are a lot faster, it's, uh, the tool itself can't handle, handle the load, and, and there's a much better tool available. <laughs> this, uh, WRK, which is available on GitHub, and that's a modern HTTP benchmarking tool. And it has a interesting feature that you could do Lua scripting to support things like checking that you're actually getting the correct result back. Then there's a different actual load testing tool kit kits for testing full use cases and stateful flows. And you can find these as tools and are also uh, in the cloud, you, you could buy these as a service. And they're helpful for doing that, but I won't be concentrating much on, on this side in this presentation. So here, here are some of the common fit pitfalls in profiling grouping Rails code. Measuring wall clock time, you get this information in the profile many times, but don't don't use it as a as a numeric value. And then measuring CPU time for certain methods and, and looking at that too much. I'm not saying that it's totally nonsense, but, but uh, you have to be able to look past the numbers and, and find, find out if there's something to look at. There, there's, a, there's also like a little small changes could, could change what it, what it shows in CPU time. Like a, but of course it's, it's a sign that there's something wrong, but you, 
you might not be able to find when you're comparing the results for compared to other method ex executions you will you probably won't be able to always find the most important one to to concentrate on next so so it's a iterative process in in doing that measurements and and learning things and once you start doing it a lot the iterations are so short that for sure you will le learn it learn a way yourself which is helpful for you and your system and your team will find a way and perhaps uh, which is common for all performance testing is that you easily rely on gut feeling that there's nothing wrong over here or, and, and you don't even measure or something like that and or do some benchmarking without proper JVM warm-up time there and ground your feet and rely on real information coming from the production environment and find ways to review production performance graphs regularly especially after making changes to those systems so that you could catch performance regressions and I'm, I'm quite sure that your system admin, admins and DevOps guys are much better in telling what, what these are. But I've just mentioned a few that there's, there's some inf information to look at. <coughs> in the cloud, there are SaaS tools like New Relic, where you could get a view of operations from the production environment. And that's actually very nice tooling, which is available on Cloud Foundry. And in the development environment, you could use a profiler and debugger to get an understanding. So the profiler isn't the only means and also use logging and different kind of things over there. And then there's different, different plugins that that help you get insight. So as a kind of a summary, the recommendations that concentrate on eliminating blocking because of Amdahl's law. And look also for low hanging fruit. There's more on the next slide if you're in a rush it's worth doing usually and concentrate on improving your feedback cycles you have in place for both development and production because they might the ways to do that is totally different in those environments and innovate and find your way and, and so it's not that you need some expensive tools or toolkits the continuous improvement there is uh, more important than the fancy tools we have available and take small steps Does anyone have uh, questions of uh, the subjects we've gone through by now? Okay. So now let's go more specifically into Grails. What I've, I'm talking about <coughs> a few things that um, I've seen quite quite a few times in when Grails has been used and there's been a performance problem and as you all know the out of the box Tomcat, Tomcat parameters they're not good for running Grails 
and then a second one is that you see that you take a huge or a really fast server and then you have a single JVM running there with a huge heap like 16 gigabytes or, or even more and that's that's not a very good choice to do because within the JVM there still is some some blocking and and it will scale much better if you have uh, multiple small JVMs running on that box and then just put a load balancer in front of that and there's also other benefits of doing that so you could do these blue green deployments and keep the availability of the system while updating it so that's about the environment and here's a long list of low-hanging fruit and um, we we won't be going into detail in all these little little items but I'll you could ask me more about this after this talk about these items and uh, or send me email or and so on so we could on the Grails mailing list or directly to me but I'll I'll be showing some of these in in my demo if if we have enough time for for doing it so the most important one usually still is that um, the database is the bottleneck in the application so you you should as a low hanging fruit you should you certainly do this as a first thing that you ha you have some kind of tooling in place to to find out what's what's what gets done in the database what kind of queries and what are the bottlenecks there and slow queries in the database and so that you get that that tuned and some tools you could even use in in production but there there might be some side effects so i i don't recommend like suddenly switching and and using these kind of tools in, in production environments. Then the second one is that you should el eliminate uh, stack traces thrown in normal program flow. It's a uh, relatively high cost to to throw an exception, and and that's that's one of the reasons because it's it's building the stack trace in, in, in Grails applications, Groovy and Grails applications, the stack traces are also very deep. So there's, there's a lot of going on in, in building that. Of, of course, it's, it's very tiny, tiny <laughs> little over, overhead of, of doing an exception, but when, when there's a huge amount of operations, like a million, million exceptions per second, like getting rid of those million exceptions per second is will certainly make your system a lot faster so that's a generic recommendation to not do a uh, pro program flow based on exceptions if you really have to do that there's ways to to override the fill fill in stack trace method on an exception where you could you could uh, prevent it filling adding the stack trace and those are much cheaper but that's not even recommended but there are some means then one surprisingly surprising one is regex there's uh, some you can find some blog posts on on the net where there's uh, demonstrations about a simple regex and to execute it with a pretty small input value it does about 100,000 operations just to run that single regex 
and if you have a system with uh, 50 concurrent users and and then there's a lot of these going on it's certainly gonna end up using a lot of CPU then another one little small tip is Java Java util properties it's 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 blocking and many times you see code where using a system property this boolean get prop boolean it's actually calling system get property first and casting that to boolean or and using these in in code will will make it block so don't do that or you could do it but what if you're doing it in concurrent code that gets executed for for each request handling that's certainly not a good thing to do and there's a small tweak what you could make uh, groovy code faster and prevent the context switch by using a for loop a normal for loop and instead of each then there's uh, two two items i i i added about uh, caching Im implementations and this is uh, perhaps something that there isn't a ready solution for for grails like a plugin that does caching this way and if you want to get high high performance uh, and the benefits of caching the you could um, add a lot of uh, performance to the cache implementation if it has a mechanism for preventing cache storms that when uh, entry gets invalidated that only a single thread goes and gets the, gets the up updated item and and another feature for for that is that the cache implementation continues serving the stale information for other threads while it's doing the update so so that's that's something that it would be nice to have a grails plugin that actually behaves that way and then there's a uh, one single one here that don't use st static transactional in services that don't need transactions or aren't operating on the on the database for for example if if you have a tag library which is uh, using a service and then it's calling a transactional service that's a common pattern i've seen in grails applications and that's that's really bad in performance wise because it's a, it's creating a new new transaction each time the tag <coughs> library is used so that's that's quite common common so let's let's see what do i have another one there here i have a a question that uh, do you know what it is a uh, tool for getting insight in sudden production performance problems and every unix based environment has this tool so if somebody knows in the audience please yeah, that's one. Any other suggestions? Like getting inside the JVM and seeing there. <laughs> so when you give a kill a dash three as a parameter it's uh, sig quit 
and it doesn't kill the process, it sends it the signal. And in the JVM, that triggers a thread dump. So it makes a thread dump of all the threads and outputs it to system out. And that ends up in Catalina out in default Tomcat config. And you could use this for sampling. Like you do several of these in a row, and then you use some kind of script or grepping, whatever you use, to find out what are the most common stack frames which are contained in those, uh, those um, stack traces. And this is a very useful tool. I've actually, most of the performance problems I've, I've seen in production environments, I've, I've been able to solve them with this simple tool, which everyone has available. And you could also use it in, in, in development environments, sometimes when you're wondering what's going on in the JVM. So I, th I, th I think I'll, the demo will be quite short, but I'm quickly showing what kind of output this uh, WRK HTTP load testing tool puts out. So it's a tool for just uh, hitting one URL, but <laughs> it's still pretty, pretty useful. And what you, what you should look for is uh, also check the latency that you don't have like some requests that are taking a long time or timing out and that the distribution is, uh, is uh, kind of stable that most of, most of the requests are handled in, in a very short time period, like the 90% line, for example. And then the total throughput, that's of course something you're you're interested in when you're measuring throughput, but latency is, is many times uh, shows how well behaving your, your system is. Because if it differs a lot, it, you, have some, you have some problem there that it's, it's getting stuck somewhere. <laughs> so how much time do we have left? So I started up the the load test, and I've uh, myself I've been using this kind of load testing that I have a script which which keeps on looping and just prints out some the round and and so that I could look at that how it's how it's changing. As you saw in the beginning, it was uh, the throughput was uh, was eight thousand four hundred. And already here it started stabilizing. And also, so that's the JVM startup. It, because uh, in the default settings, you need at least 10,000 calls for a method to, to get, so that the JIT starts uh, compiling those. And besides that, it's important to have a short delay because uh, it seems to be that the JVM, it postpones some of the optimizations until the system starts idling. So, so that's, in, in load testing, a, a simple script like that could help. And I, I have this uh, available at, on GitHub. There's a Grails perf tests under, underneath my, my GitHub account. And I'll push the latest changes there. So that's that's about uh, the the tool you could use, 
and this was uh, simple script like like that simple sh s shell script which is calling that so you could you could have something like that but whatever works for for you is 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 what what you do what you should do There's a bug that d doesn't show the command line after hides it, but I, I have a setup in that application so that it, um, when I add a certain system property on the command line, it adds a your kit to your kit configuration to the Grails application, and this makes it easy to to start up Grails with your kit activated on it. And then, then I, I could uh, after that I could open up uh, your kit, and I could see the process there. So this is this is your kit, and in, in uh, since I started. Grails with that parameter I have hidden underneath the covers, it connected to your kit profiler automatically at the startup. The most important things to do in the, in the profiler is to look for blocking and let's see if we could introduce some some here now now it's we can start seeing seeing the load showing up there and it's actually behaving pretty well Right. I'm gonna have to scroll down a bit to see so these red I'm not sure if the colors you could see see the colors it's pretty tiny but um, there's not too too much blocking here so that we could find out but at the beginning, what I, what I do is um, I click on the timeline where I see red marks, and then there's a thread dump at, at that moment. It's shown shown here, and if there's a lot of blocking, you'll you'll see the dump of the thread thread that's blocking in the stack trace and it's easy to spot spot the blocking the thing that's causing the blocking however this uh, demo we have to make a change that causes some blocking to find to properly demonstrate this feature I'll show about the exceptions this is something that is very easy to check if you have a load test that represents the usage patterns of your applications. So it, it has a, for each kind of exception, it will has a, have a counter. And when you do the testing, you reset this counter Here's a 
ICANN for, for doing that, clear exceptions. And I'll click on that. And now since we have the test running, no new exceptions sh should show up here. And that's, that's how we find out if, if we were doing it properly. But if you're getting exceptions here, when, when you have the test running, there's something, your code is throwing those exceptions. There's also other ways to find out this. You could certainly use a debugger and attach it to, to any exception thrown and, or, or things like that. So this, this was it and any questions? Thanks.